Well, howdy. All right. Hey, uh, it's great to see you for a second week in a row here at FaithBridge. I'm always delighted uh, at the chance to be with you. I want to start by sharing with you something that I've shared before, but for the ladies in the room, I just want to fill you in on what happens when guys get out of the city and get around a fire, okay? Anytime men get out of the city and get around a fire, uh, men take on uh, one of three types of people. Men become one of three types of men around a campfire. The first type of guy around a campfire is the sit back and relax guy. That's the guy who shows up, watches other people build the fire, and uh, finds his seat, sits down, and doesn't move the rest of the night. Like if that fire begins to dwindle down, he begins to believe and realize that this night is coming to an end. And when the fire is out, he assumes it's time to go to bed, okay? That's the sit back and relax guy. The second guy is the lighter fluid guy, okay? You need to know, ladies, that uh, inside of every man is a pyro gene, and that gene kind of comes out most fully in middle school and then can go dormant for decades and then resurface anytime an adult man, no matter how old he is, gets around a fire. So I don't know if you've ever seen a middle school student with a bottle of lighter fluid, but the same thing that happens with a group of middle school guys happens with a group of adult men, okay? They take that bottle of lighter fluid, they spray the fire, it flares up, and then they pass the bottle and the next guy does it. And it's always just as exciting every single time for every single man, okay? And then the third type of guy around the fire is the cultivator, okay? This is, this is the Boy Scout. This is the guy that um, refuses to settle for a mediocre fire. He, he wants to, to build a bonfire, like no matter what. So this is the guy that will just disappear into the woods without saying a word. He'll just disappear for 30 minutes and then return like carrying an entire tree with him. Like this is the guy who shows up with like an ax attached to his belt. It's like you came to do damage to something. And that's the guy who will disappear and come back because he believes that it is his mission that weekend to build and maintain an incredible fire. Uh, the reason I share that with you is because we're in this second week of a series on marriage. And I believe that a fire is a really great picture for a marriage. You need to know that if you're here and you are married, then the fire of your marriage will look different at different times. Like there's going to be times where the fire of your marriage appears to be raging and then there's going to be times where it feels like it's kind of dwindling. And in your marriage, you're going to become one of three types of people. You might become the sit back and relax person. You might be the person who says, you know what, I helped this fire get going because I stood on the altar and I said, I do, but now the honeymoon phase is over and maybe you're, you're a decade in and, and you're at a point where you're just kind of sitting back and you're watching the fire of your marriage dwindle and you just don't have the motivation to do anything about it. You're looking around hoping that maybe your spouse is going to do something about it, but you're just not prepared to exert the effort that's needed to maintain the fire of your marriage. Maybe you'll be the lighter fluid person in your marriage, and you're more event-driven. That you're expecting these big flare-ups, but then there's, there's the dwindling down of your fire, and so you're just in this rhythm of flare-up, dwindle down, flare-up, and dwindle down. Maybe you come to this series at Faith Bridge, and it's going to flare-up, and then over the next few months, it's going to dwindle down, and then you guys are going to have a much-needed date night, and it's going to flare-up, and then you're going to go for a few months without another date night, it's going to dwindle down. Then you're going to get away for a weekend for the first time in three years, it's going to flare-up, and then you're going to wait another three years, and it's going to dwindle down, and it's event-driven. You're just going to move from event to event to event to kind of save and spark your marriage. <clears throat> or you're going to be the cultivator, and I'm just going to show you my cards right now. That's what you want to be. You want to be the cultivator. You want to be the person that says, I want to do whatever it takes to stoke the fire of our marriage. I want us to have a healthy marriage, but marriage takes work. You need to hear that. Marriage takes takes work. 13 years into marriage, I will tell you I love marriage. I'm a big advocate for marriage. I highly recommend marriage, but marriage is a lot of work. 
And so a cultivators in marriage realize, you know, this thing isn't going to just sustain itself, and it's going to take work, it's going to take effort, but I'm going to be one of the people who does whatever I need to do to ensure that the fire of our marriage continues to grow. We don't want to be people who just sit around and watch the fires of our marriage dwindle. We don't. And so here's what I'm going to do this morning. I want us to look back in the Song of Solomon, and I'm going to give you seven diagnostic questions for you to ask yourself that will ultimately help you be a cultivator in your marriage. Now, if you're sitting there saying, well, I'm not married, so this talk clearly doesn't apply to me, I want you to know that these seven questions are for you, whether you're married or single. Every person in here needs to answer these questions, and if you are single, I wouldn't be surprised if these questions save your marriage before it even begins. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to the Song of Solomon. That's where we're going to be this morning. And we will start in the very first verse of the entire book. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. If you're not familiar with Song of Solomon, if you weren't here last week, This book is God's instruction manual to us on finding love, making love, and maintaining love. In this book, God reveals to us his ideal for marriage. And so it basically chronicles this relationship between a man and a woman, and it's a conversation back and forth between the two of them. Now, as I give you these seven questions, let me just be clear. My goal isn't to give you ammunition today against your spouse, so keep your elbows to yourself today, okay? At no point do you elbow and point and say, I hope you're listening. That's not what you're doing today. And No point during this week do you say, oh, clearly you're not going to pay attention to TA. Clearly you're not going to apply what you learned at church this week. No, we're not doing that. I'm giving you ammunition not to fight with each other. I'm giving you ammunition to fight against your true enemy, okay? The first question that I think you need to ask yourself is this, how do you smell, okay? And I need you to bear with me while I explain what I even mean by that. Some of you don't need explanation. That question was enough, and you need to go and apply something to your life. But uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. I love how this book starts. It's the woman talking, and she just says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Man, you know it's going to be a good book when it starts out like that. For your love is better than wine. Now listen to what she says. Uh, Your anointing oils are fragrant Your name is oil poured out. So what you need to know is in the ancient Near East, um, they didn't have water on tap. Like bathing was a luxury, and so men would use oils and spices and fragrances to mask their natural musk. Now, for the high school guys in here, you might be sitting there thinking, the Bible has never made more sense to me than right now. Because... (laughs) You've bought into a lie that Axe Body Spray is a shower replacement instead of a shower enhancement. Let me just lovingly say, no, all right? (laughs) But I just want you to see what she's saying here. What she's saying is, hey, uh, Solomon, you look and you smell good. So, men, it's good for us to just pay attention to that, and it's good for us to care at least a little what we look and smell like. But that's not really why I ask this question, how do you smell? The reason that I want you to ask yourself that question is because what she says in the second half of her statement, she says, your anointing oils are fragrant, your name is oil poured out. In the ancient Near East, name was a reference to your reputation or character. And so what she does is she moves from the physical smell of her man to the metaphorical smell of his character and reputation. So it's good for us to just ask ourselves, how does our character smell? How does your character smell? Let me just give you a vision for what you want. And I'm not just talking to guys, I'm talking to men and women right now. How does your character smell? Here's a vision for what you want in your marriage. I'll give you a vision by just telling you this. Um, When my oldest son Noah was born, he was the first grandkid on either side of the family. So when we showed up to Christmas break uh, for that first Christmas, we rarely got to hold our son because the grandparents always wanted to be holding him. And so the rare moments that I got to hold Noah, it only took a second or two before I would get a whiff of old lady perfume. And it was clear that Noah had been with either Teta or Nana, one of his grandmothers. 
And the reason I tell you that is because that's what you want in your marriage. When you wake up in the morning and your spouse gets around you, or when you sit down at the dinner table at night and you sit with your spouse or your kids, or while you and your spouse are getting your kids to bed at night, or when you and your spouse and your kids go on vacation, or you and your spouse together just go on vacation, it shouldn't take long before your spouse begins to smell Jesus in your life. You want it to smell as if you have been around Jesus recently. That's what you want. And that's what happens when men and women submit their lives to the leadership of Jesus Christ. That's what happens when a man or a woman wakes, every, wakes up every day and submits their lives to the words of this book. You can't know God's ways without first knowing his word. What happens when you wake up and you engage with God in prayer and you say yes to him and his desires for your life in your marriage, you know what happens is you begin to smell as if you've been around Jesus. So how does your character smell right now? Can the people in your life smell that you have been with Jesus? Let me just be clear what Jesus smells like. Jesus smells like conviction, not compromise. Let me just ask you, how does your life smell right now? Does it smell more of uh, conviction or compromise? You know what I mean by conviction? I mean that Jesus' way has become your way. Jesus' standard is your standard. What I mean by compromise is that you're just simply settling for something less. So does your life smell of conviction or, uh, or compromise? When it comes to the language that you use around your spouse or your kids, does your life smell of conviction or compromise? When it comes to how you use alcohol, do you smell of conviction or compromise? When it comes to overspending, using money that you really don't have, do you smell of conviction or compromise? When it comes to what you do when you're away from your spouse, do you smell of conviction or compromise? This will just help you evaluate how your character smells. Let me just give you another way to evaluate the smell of your character. Do you smell of faithfulness or flakiness? Like, do you say what you're going to do? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you follow through? If you commit to doing something, do you actually follow through and do that? We want to be people who smell of faithfulness, not flakiness. And then how about this? Do you smell of selfishness or do you smell of sacrifice? See, a lot of times we get into marriage expecting to get. But marriage is more about giving than receiving. It truly is. Marriage is about laying your life down for the other person. It's about looking out not only for your own interests, but the interest of others. It's modeling the attitude of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, and he gave his life for you and for me. In marriage, we are supposed to give ourselves for the sake of the other person. So how do you smell? Do you smell of selfishness or do you smell of sacrifice? This past week I was in Colorado with a, with a group of, of men and I will never forget what this guy who'd been married 30 years said. He, he was just talking about a time in his marriage when his wife had lost all desire for him. And what he realized is that he was prioritizing his work over his spouse. And this is the thing that he realized. He realized that a godly woman is attracted to godliness. And so a shift had to take place in his life. Those were his exact words. I realized that a godly woman is going to be attracted to godliness. And so he had to shift his priorities. What happened was he realized that his character had a little funk to it. And he needed to freshen up. And so let me just say, we're all imperfect people in here. Every single one of us probably has a little spiritual BO. We all need to freshen up in some way. So just evaluate your own life. How do you smell? And if you can realize some funk in your life, address it. The second diagnostic question to ask yourself is this. Do you have the right people in your life? Do you have the right people in your life? Look with me at verse 9. This is Solomon talking. He says this. He says, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Let me just encourage you men, do not do this in your marriage. Don't be like, baby, you're like a horse. Don't, that won't mean anything to your wife. 
But he goes on, he says, your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. And now the girl's group of friends chimes in. That's why I love the Bible, because it gets us, because this is a guy and a girl, young in their relationship. Anytime there's a guy and a girl that are starting to connect, there's always a group of girls nearby talking about the guy and the girl. So listen to what the group of girls say. They say, we will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. You know what her friends are saying? They're saying, hey, we're going to work hard to make you as beautiful as possible for your guy. Now, ladies, what I want to do is I want to just take you back to the time when you began to date your man. I really want to take you back to your time in college or the time that you had roommates. And for the men in here, men, I just want to fill you in on actually what happened when you got on the phone and you asked that girl out and I want to fill you in on what took place right after she hung up the phone. This is, this is how girls in college operate. This, ladies, this is probably what happened a while back when that guy asked you out, okay? Men, you call up your girl, who is now your wife, and you asked her out. She hung up the phone, and right after she hung up the phone, here's what she did. She just called out. She goes, ladies, assemble! And when she said that, all of her closest girlfriends, it didn't matter what continent they were on, they all magically appeared in the room with her. It's crazy how that happens. They gathered around, and she filled them in on the fact that you just asked her out. And they made some noises. And then they asked her the question. Notice I didn't say they asked her a question. No, they asked her the question. The question that they asked her was, what are you going to (laughs) wear? And she then gave them the response. The response is, I don't really have anything. And that's all that group of friends needed to hear to then snap into action. Men, you need to know that when that door opened up, when you went to pick her up, she didn't own anything that she was wearing. (laughs) It was someone else's earrings, it was someone else's shoes, it was someone else's top. And I love that because, ladies, you guys get that. Like, you get the idea of, I want to help you become more beautiful for the man that's about to pick you up. But you know what's even more incredible? What's more incredible is when there's a group of women that see it as their ambition to not just make their friend more beautiful physically, but to make their friend more beautiful spiritually and emotionally. And this isn't just for the ladies in the room. This is for everyone. We all need a few men or a few women in our lives who are committed to making us into the men or the women that God has called us to be. Like men, do you have those those guys in your life who are committed to refining you and sharpening you and molding you and shaping you into the man that God has called you to be in marriage. Ladies, do you have a couple women in your life who are committed to making you more beautiful, not just physically, but more beautiful emotionally and spiritually? It is, it is essential. Like it is a non-negotiable. Every person in this room needs men or women in your life who have the right to say anything to you without you getting defensive. Every single one of us need a few men or a few women who can ask us anything and you'll give them an honest response. So do you have that in your life? Let me just ask you, do you have a few men or a few women who can ask you questions like this? Number one, are you spending daily time with God? Number two, have you been speaking your spouse's love language? If you don't know what a love language is, just go Google it and apply it. Number three, where are you and your spouse at odds and what can you do to take a step? Here's another question. Have you had any inappropriate interactions with people who aren't your spouse? Another great question. Are you prioritizing your spouse over your kids and your work? Let's just be clear. The only person that you've made a covenant with is your spouse. You didn't make a covenant with your kids. You haven't made a covenant with your work. But you did stand in an altar before God and you made a covenant with your spouse. That's why you love your kids, but you prioritize your spouse. Because your spouse ultimately is more important than your kids. And I stand by that. 
Last question, are you operating as a conqueror, as a cultivator? This is really for the men in the room. Are you operating with your wife as a conqueror or a cultivator? The reason I even ask this question is because um, men, we have to realize that sometimes we use our best material on the wrong side of marriage. Like while we're dating, we're all about romance and chivalry and creativity, and then we get married and we become dull, um, passive, and apathetic. That's a conqueror. That's someone who says, you know what? The battle is won. I finally got someone to say yes to me. That's a conqueror. No, a cultivator is a guy who becomes a Boy Scout in marriage. It's someone who says, I refuse to watch the fire of my marriage dwindle for the sake of my work or for the sake of you fill in the blank. Do you have the right people in your life who can help sharpen you and encourage you to be the man or the woman God has called you to be. The third diagnostic question that I encourage you to ask is this. Are you letting your spouse wonder? Are you letting your spouse wonder? Look with me at Song of Solomon chapter two, verse one. This is the girl talking. She's expressing some insecurity. Here's what she says. She says, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. She's basically saying, look, I'm just a common flower in this country. I'm like a lily among lilies. There's nothing special about me. And the guy chimes in and responds and says, as a lily among brambles, so is my love among the young women. He's saying, you're not a lily among lilies. You're a lily among thorns. There is actually no one else like you. And she returns the favor. Listen to what she says in verse 3. She says, As an apple tree among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. They are affirming affirming each other. They're going back and forth, um, canceling out any insecurity that they might have. And we see this played out later on in their marriage. Listen to what the guy says in Song of Solomon chapter 7 to his wife. Verse 6. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. That's a man talking to his wife after potential years of marriage. And listen to the security that she feels in verse 10. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. What I want to make you understand is anytime you leave your spouse to wonder how you're feeling about him or her, anytime you leave your spouse to wonder, he or she will wander into insecurity. I'm not just talking about women here. I'm talking about men. Ladies, men need to know how you feel about them. And men, ladies, your, your wives need to know. Your wife needs to know how you feel about her. Don't just assume that your spouse is always confident how you feel. So you need to communicate early, often, consistently, and continuously how you feel about your spouse. Let me just encourage you to do a couple things. Number one, be a student of your spouse. Be a student. Find new things to appreciate. Believe that there is more to learn and more to love. Like, believe that today. When you go to lunch, believe that there's more to learn and more to love about your spouse. The second thing I want to encourage you to do is this. Celebrate the things that your spouse is supposed to be doing. Because the reality is that there are plenty of marriages where spouses aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. What I'm telling you is be thankful when your spouse does what they're supposed to be doing. Our tendency is to take one another for granted because we sit there and say, well, you're just doing what you're supposed to be doing. Like, why would I say thank you when you do what you're supposed to do? You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, but I just need you to zoom out and think, you know what, there's a lot of spouses that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, so I should actually say thank you that my spouse has chosen to do what he or she is supposed to do. What that means is actually learn how to say thank you for things like when your spouse gets up and goes to work, you know what, some spouses might choose to get up and not go to work. So it's a good thing to say, you know, I just want to say thank you that you are faithful to go to work to provide for a family. You know what? You say thank you for um, cooking meals and doing laundry and dressing the kids and mowing the yard and you name it. But these are good things to say thank you for. I don't know how long it took you to gather all of the supplies needed for cooking this meal and I don't know what everything, I don't know everything that was going on. All I know is I'm thankful that when I came home, there was a meal to eat. You know what? I open my drawer and there's something clean in it every day. You know what? That doesn't have to be the case. I just want to say thank you. 
Thank you for being faithful to do what God's called you to do. Celebrate the things that your spouse is supposed to be doing. The next diagnostic question I want to encourage you to ask is this. Does your marriage feel more like winter or spring? Does it feel more like winter or spring? Look at chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. The girl's talking and she says, My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. So what's happening here is Solomon is inviting his girl to go on a walk with him. And he's describing how it feels outside. He, this is a guy in love. I don't know if you saw it, but he used the word turtle dove in talking to his girl. Anytime a guy does that, he's in love, all right? Anytime a guy's writing poetry, he's in love. That's what's happening here. And he's saying, you know what? It's spring outside. It is spring outside, but it's also spring inside of our relationship. You think about spring, like here in Texas, that's like a day, all right, when we experience spring. But I just want you to think about like that one day where you go outside and it's sunny and 75 and there's a slight breeze and the breeze hits your skin and you close your eyes and you just stand for a second and you think everything is right in the world. And that tomorrow it's going to feel like I'm standing in front of a blowtorch. So today <laughs> everything is good. What he's saying is, you know what? Our relationship feels like spring, like it's not perfect, it is work, but you know what? Things are working. Things are moving along, there's life and there's joy in our relationship. See, when your marriage feels like spring, you know what? You praise God for it. Because it's when your marriage feels like spring that the fire of your marriage feels like it's ra raging. Those are good moments in your marriage. And it's good to realize that your marriage is going to go through different seasons. There's times where your marriage is going to feel like summer in Texas. There's going to be a lot of sweat. It's going to be a lot of hard work. But what you want to guard against, you want to guard against the times when your marriage feels like winter. Because what's winter? Winter's the time of year when things die or go dormant. And you look at the trees and it's hard to see any sign of real life. You want to guard against your marriage feeling like winter. Let me just say this. If your marriage feels like winter right now, don't just wait hoping that things are naturally going to change like seasons. Because while after winter comes spring, that isn't always a given in marriage. So if your marriage feels like winter right now, get help. Asking for help isn't a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength. That's a sign of you being someone who cares enough to not sit by while the fire of your marriage dwindles and gets snuffed out. If you need to call the church and ask for help, do it. If you need to go see a marriage counselor, do it. Fight for your marriage. Ask the question, does your marriage feel more like winter or spring? Next diagnostic question I want to encourage you to ask is this. What are the foxes in your marriage? Look back at the text, chapter 2, verse 15. The, the picture is that Solomon and his girl go for a walk, and as they go for a walk, they pass by a, by a vineyard. And as they pass by a vineyard, they see foxes destroying the vineyard and digging up its roots. And so as they pass by, the girl looks at Solomon and says this in verse 15, catch the foxes for us. The little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. She's saying, hey, it is spring in our relationship. Things are going extremely well, but let's not be naive. There are actually things that are out to ruin our relationship. So Solomon, identify the foxes and deal with the foxes because we want to maintain what is good and healthy in our marriage. And so just ask yourself this diagnostic question. What are the foxes in your marriage? Is it finances? Are finances a, a consistent point of conflict for you and your spouse? Okay, get an outside perspective. Get some help. Get some direction. Is it the way y'all communicate? Is there a lack of communication? 
Is there a lot of miscommunication? Is it unspoken expectations that you think things should go one way, your spouse is thinking things should go the other way, but y'all never actually express your expectations? Is it incorrect priorities? Is it a lack of intimacy in the marriage? What are the foxes in your marriage? For you, it might be busyness. It might be that you are, you are too busy right now. Let me just say this. If you're too busy to have a date night with your spouse, you're too busy. Period. You're too busy and something needs to change. It might mean that your kid can't play in three sports leagues. That might be what it means. It might mean that your kid has to take a break from that sport that requires you to be out five nights a week for the sake of your marriage. Let me just tell you what a blessing that will be to your kid to see you fight for your marriage over fighting for the sport that they definitely won't play in college. <laughs> I'm just being straight up with you. Let's move on, that's too convicting. And please don't email me that your kid is going to play sports in college. If he is, great. But he probably won't. All right. <laughs> Next question I want to encourage you to ask yourself is this, has routine led to a rut? Has routine led to a rut? Look at chapter 7 of Song of Solomon. Here's what you need to know is that there's two points in the book. There's two different chapters um, of intimacy, physical intimacy between Solomon and this girl. Like we get to be the creepy people looking in as they experience physical intimacy. The first chapter that this shows up is in chapter four. It's Solomon and his wife's wedding night. And on their wedding night, Solomon admires his wife's beauty. And the way he does that is by starting at the top of her body and working his way down. So he goes from her hair to her eyes to her cheeks, to her teeth, to her neck, and on down. Okay, in chapter seven, he's gonna go the opposite direction. He's gonna start at her feet and move up. So let's just listen. We're not gonna unpack this, but it's just fun to read anyway. So chapter seven, verse one, he says this, how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter. Men, isn't that awesome? He talks about her shoes because women have a lot of shoes. I mean, you unpack the box, boxes, plural, that said shoes on the side of him when you guys got married. How beautiful are your feet and sandals, a noble daughter. Now watch this. Your rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master hand. Your navel is a rounded bowl that never lacks makes wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat. Let's stop right there for sure. <laughs> Man, let's just be clear. Your wife doesn't have a belly. She has a stomach, okay? And number two, it is never a heap of anything, all right? <laughs> never a heap of <laughs> anything. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Remember, this is the word of God. That's just, it is. It's profitable for teaching. Here we go, verse four. <laughs> Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Hezbon by the gate of uh, bath Rabum. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon. I have no clue what that means. <laughs> Which looks toward Damascus. Damascus, your head crowns you like Carmel, and your flowing locks are like purple. A king is held captive in the tresses. I love this. I love it. Because you compare chapter 4, which is their wedding night, to chapter seven, which is years into marriage. And what do you see? You see Solomon spicing things up. You see Solomon keeping things fresh. He starts at the bottom now and he works his way up. And I love that because Solomon refuses to slip into a routine even with intimacy. See, in marriage, we have to guard ourselves against routines that, leads, that lead to ruts. Some routines are good. Like you probably need a routine with your kids. If you don't have a routine with your kids, things are gonna struggle. Your marriage will struggle because you don't have a routine with your kids. It's good to have a routine of praying together. If you guys don't pray together now, I wanna encourage you to start praying together. I still remember someone saying, hey, couples who pray together stay together. There's probably something to that. 
So if there's no routine, you don't need to feel bad about that, but tonight's a good night to start. When you guys get into bed, just, just get into bed, and one of you guys take a moment and pray for your marriage, pray for your family. Get into a routine of that. Get into a routine of having a regular date night. Those are good routines to have. The problem is that when, the problem comes when routines lead to ruts. So you need to identify, are y'all in a routine now of getting the kids to bed and then you guys find your place in the house to just kind of zone out? Like the TV goes on, y'all sit on opposite sides of the couch and you just tune out, zone out until it's bedtime. Or maybe you find your own individual places to get a book and you read. And there's really no meaningful interaction at night. Those are routines that can lead to ruts. Or if when you do go on day night, you just go to the same restaurant and you just stare at each other because you don't know what to talk about anymore. These are ruts that can actually be harmful to your marriage. So it's good to identify the ruts that are in your marriage and do something about them. Spice things up, keep things fresh. I want to encourage you just to really practically, number one, establish a weekly date. And if you can't do it every week, do it every other week. I want to encourage you at least twice a month, you need a date. You're like, we don't have the money for that. You know what? You can get an ice cream cone from McDonald's for less than a dollar, and you can sit in your car where no kids are around, and you can just enjoy talking to each other. It's not quantity of time. You can have a lot of quality time in an hour with an ice cream cone. It's not an issue with cost. You can do it in your house. I mean, you can set up, you can light candles. Like, that is easy to do. You can sit at the dining room instead of on the couch to eat your food. You can sit at the table and you can have meaningful conversation. But you need time dating one another. Establish a weekly date. If you can't do it at night, hey, you know what? My wife and I have done date breakfasts before. Those work too. It counts. Get away together at least once a year. I would encourage you to get away together at least, even twice a year if you can. I want to encourage you to Google great date night questions. My wife and I, we went to New York uh, back in December, and man, I just started Googling great date night questions. There's a lot of dumb questions out there, but man, we tapped into a list of 40 meaningful questions. So all throughout our three days in New York, whenever we shared a meal, I'd just say, okay, let's go to the next question. And it generated all of this great meaningful conversation. We left that trip so refreshed. There's so much at your fingertips. All you have to do is ask Google for some help. (laughs) And he, she, or it will give it. Okay. Establish a time that you pray together regularly and then identify love languages and speak them. If you don't know what a love language is, I just encourage you to identify it and speak it. The reason that a lot of people have affairs, I think, is because an affair will break the routine. It feels like a lifeline or rescue from a rut. So just ask the question, has routine led to a rut? The last diagnostic question I want to encourage you to ask yourself is this, will you choose to love? Will you choose to love? Listen to what the girl says in Song of Solomon chapter 8. This is the true love passage of the Bible. It's not 1 Corinthians 13. That was written to the church. This is written to husbands and wives. She says this in Song of Solomon chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. She says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. I love what she says. She, she pictures love being as strong as death. In the ancient Near East, people would compare their feelings to death to indicate the intensity of their feelings. And I just want you to think about the fact that death is irreversible. Death is permanent. No one ever dies and changes their mind. That's not a thing. Death is a one-way ticket. So what she says is, she says, my love is as strong as death. It's permanent. It's irreversible. And so it's just good for us to identify. It, it needs, it's, it's good for us to understand that love, all throughout your marriage, it will be a choice. 
It will be a choice. You will have to choose to love. But we need to understand that on our wedding days, we took vows, like we stood on the altar, and we promised to love in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, good times and bad times, until death do us part. But many of us are operating in marriage with hidden caveats. We're saying, I promise to love you as long as I'm happy in this marriage. I promise to love you until death as long as you meet my needs. I promise to love you until death as long as this thing is working and it doesn't take too much of a fight for us. You know what? I promise to love you till death as long as I'm still physically attracted to you and my physical needs are getting met. Those are hidden caveats that you didn't share on your wedding day. So that's not right for you to take a vow before God and operate with caveats that you didn't share before God with your spouse. So you have to understand in marriage, you will have to choose to love. Now, let me just be clear real quick. Some of you guys are in abusive relationships. I'm not just telling you, you just need to, you just need to wait it out and work it. No, you need to find safety and you need to find help. But for the more, majority of people in this room, we have to get to a point where we choose to love. And I just love the picture that she gives. She says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it out. She's picturing love like a fire. And she's saying, it doesn't matter what floods come, it doesn't matter what storms come our way. Nothing will be able to extinguish our love because we will fight for our love and we will choose to love for a lifetime. You know what makes this type of love possible? It's knowing the love of Jesus Christ. It's easier to express this type of love once you've experienced this type of love. See, everything we've talked about today actually points to the greater love that's available to each one of us in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wants to cultivate. He's the ultimate cultivator who left heaven and came to earth to cultivate a relationship between us and God the Father. And he doesn't want you to wonder how he feels about you. He gave his life to have you. He wants a spring-like relationship with you where you guys are connected and intimacy happens between you and your maker. He's already caught the foxes of sin that threaten to separate you from God for all of eternity. He caught the foxes of Satan, sin, and death and dealt with them satisfactorily. And now, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, and nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. That is the love that we've experienced. If we say we know Jesus Christ, that is what you and me have experienced. If that's what we've experienced, may that be the type of love that we express to one another. My hope and prayer for us today is that we would not, that we would reject being the sit back and relax guy, that we would refuse to be the lighter fluid guy, and that we would insist on being the cultivators in our marriage. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come and do a work in our hearts. We all, Lord God, need help. We need your strength. Lord, you know the state of every marriage in the room. You know what each of them need. And so I pray for the people in the room who are wanting to end their marriage today or tomorrow. Lord, I pray God, you, that you would sustain them today and that they would choose to fight. And for the marriage, marriages that are thriving right now, Lord, I pray that they would never get comfortable, that they would never take their foot off the gas of cultivating. Lord, I pray that we would be people who express Christ-like love to one another because we have first experienced your love. And if there's anyone here today who does not know your love in a personal way, then I pray that they would. We need you, Lord God. Would you do a great work in our hearts? In Jesus' name, amen.